Welcome back. And as was mentioned earlier in the show, the focus of this conversation is surviving violence in our schools, communities, and families. And joining us for this conversation is the licensed clinical social worker, Jean Abbott. We're joined by Tina Augustus, the director of Project HEAL. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Now, this is a, a very interesting uh, conversation, and let's just talk about uh, your background first, Jean, and how you first came to Belize, um, how you came to Belize to do this work. Um, my background is trauma work, and so in the United States, I worked with immigrants and refugees who fled war or who had been tortured and who settled in the United States but couldn't settle. Something was wrong they still were suffering from the torture they experienced in the past. Mm -hmm. So my study was how can you heal torture or the pains of war or the pains of memory? Really it's the pains of memory. And in, um, in that study I became interested in working with survivors all over the world. The theory says you have to be out of the situation of violence. That can't be. Too many people in the world are in the middle of violence. We've got to find ways of calming that down and healing the trauma of being in the middle of violence. So that's my work now and Belize is teaching me a lot about it. Yeah. So you were recruited to come to Belize. Yes, yeah. literally. <laughs> she's actually, Project Heal has a St. Louis donor group, and she's actually best friends for over 40 years with one of our donors. Yes. And Maureen keeps on talking all these amazing things about Jean, and she said it would be <laughs> really, really great if Jean could come, and we managed to make that work, and she's here for about three weeks doing some amazing workshops for schools, for mental health professionals, for principals, um, all of which I think they're finding very useful so far. Now, just based on what Jean uh, said she has been doing, you know, very often you don't think about those kinds of trauma with a place like Belize. Yes, yes. No, all you think is, oh, I'm going to beautiful Belize. Mm -hmm. And then you find Belize has suffered a lot. Now, and, and that's an important point to touch on because when you make the reference of working uh, with victims of torture or victims of war or survivors uh, of these incidences, and uh, you compare it to your work here in Belize, a lot of people will say, but we don't have a war in our societies. We don't, in our communities, we don't have violence at that level. How do you explain to people that the essence of trauma is not necessarily seeing a, a, a military war taking place? I, you know, that's an excellent question. And it's, I know I want to serve people of Belize, but Belize is helping me too. You don't have a formal war, but there are areas of Belize City where you have gangs. Mm -hmm. And how do you translate gangs? Gangs are in um, little groups of violence. Why not be soldiers? Mm -hmm. Why not be um, invaders? But these little groups of gangs are causing tremendous fear and pain to schools and families and communities. And while we're addressing the fear and, oh my gosh, my child was beat up or my child was shot or my husband was shot going to work, why isn't that the same as a war? It has the same fear reaction in the brain. The fear chemicals go down. It's the same chemicals in the body. So we can call it war mm -hmm. or we can call it gang activity. My concern is who are the gangs made up of? Children of Belizeans. Mm -hmm. How can we save them? How can we get them out of that? Mm -hmm. Now, you also said something earlier about uh, removing people from their particular situation so that they can heal or that it's not completely necessary. But how do you uh, work with people who very often we're taught, even with addictions, for example, yeah. that you can't go back to your community because you will have some of the same challenges. You get people to have a mind shift, so to speak, uh, looking at uh, the situation that they're in, but also healing um, during that process. You know, 
I think that's an excellent question, and I think um, countries all over the world need to ask that. How can we go into traumatized communities where people have become afraid of each other and afraid of going outside, afraid of having the kids walk to school, and form communities of healing, communities of confrontation of the violence? People can't do that by themselves. They can get traumatized by themselves, a gunshot, a wound, but healing takes a community. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it's interesting because Belizeans are a community people and the violence in this city is breaking that up. It's going toward their very nature. How can we pull that community back and form a strong force that doesn't fight the violence but starts to heal those kids within those gangs? Tricky if there's drugs. If there's one thing that I've learned throughout the workshops, and I think Jean does a really good job of explaining it, is that while we all experience trauma individually, and in some cases as a community, a large part of what heals trauma are relationships. Yes. And building on those relationships and being supportive of each other. There's, there's a difference in constantly breaking each other down and, and correcting each other as opposed to supporting each other. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a part of the process of healing learning how to be there for each other consistently through whatever they're experiencing, whether they're fearful at that time, whatever they're going through. So that is also important. Let me step back just a bit because I think it is important to address this issue adequately. What are the signs of a community or school or family that is affected by trauma? How do you know um, that there, because there is an actual reaction with the brain, there, yes, there, yeah. there are behaviors that are indicative of uh, people who are living in or have experienced trauma. Let's talk about that and let's uh, cite examples as to whether or not we're seeing that in Belize. Well, and um, Tina can say it. I worked with this beautiful young woman named Rosanna, mm -hmm. and I keep calling her Rosanna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you have teachers snapping at teachers or gossiping about teachers, I usually don't go bad. I usually go, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. What needs to be soothed? Mm -hmm. What needs to be healed? When you have families that blow up on each other and hurt each other. You have a lot of domestic violence here and some alcoholism. Where is that coming from? So a lot of times you begin to treat the roots of it rather than the symptoms. If a family is violent with each other, what's the root of the fear or the anguish or the exhaustion? You know, exhaustion causes violence. Um, if I can't feed my children, I get tense and I can get violent. So what are the roots of particular families' violence? And that takes not correction, it takes compassion. Mm -hmm. so, as I'm listening um, to, the, to the conversation, one of the things that uh, we know we have a challenge with in Belize is the idea that people are not very often open to counseling. When you're talking about all of this stuff, and then people are saying, but yeah, you can talk this and you can say that, but I have to survive in this reality. How do you get people to understand that that perhaps is a springboard into actually healing and living differently? The, the counseling, the conversation, the talk therapy, so, so to speak. You know, it's not only Belizeans, <laughs> all over the world. So you hear people go, I don't need to go to therapy, I'm okay. The truth is, it's pain inside. So I think, honestly, a lot of people don't need to come to me and talk. They need somebody like Tina to facilitate groups coming together and sharing commonly the fear. If a group, people can join a group talk with each other, admit their fear, and then start to build as a community. It's a community thing. The healing is a community process. And um, Tina is working with the teachers to form communities. 
and with the kids to form communities. It's a community process. It doesn't have to be in a private therapy room. Mm -hmm. I've treated people who were uh, severely tortured in a community private room. I mean, in a private room, but sometimes um, violence causes the person's shame. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't, but it does. So sometimes you start in a room, but you always build toward community. And Belize is a community-based society. Yeah. Let's, let's expand the conversation a bit at this point. We are joined, of course, uh, by president of the Mental Health Association, who made her way in from Belmopan for us this morning. Thank you, Jenny Lovell. And uh, we know that the work, Jean, you're here, we're working both with uh, Project Heal and it's work in the St. Martin's community. And all, all Catholic schools within, within Belize City as well. Okay. So we've been expecting. So within the schools. Mm -hmm. And then we also have uh, mental health professionals who are benefiting from the work here. How does uh, Jean's expertise fit within the work that you're both individually doing? Well, see, Jean was trained in torture, or she does work with torture, but we have lots and lots of our children who are growing up being beaten. Mm -hmm. They are, they're being molested or raped. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big problem. Every day you open a newspaper and you see mm -hmm. um, several children, several incidents where children have been raped, molested, traumatized. We have domestic violence is a big problem in yeah. our country. And we don't think about those things as being trauma. And so we want our mental health personnel to be exposed to this training so that they too can start doing groups. Um, particularly, we have people coming from all over the country. So they can work with, the school counselors can work with their students in groups. We have the, um, nurses who can work with their, some of their patients are depressed for from some of these traumas that they've been through. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we definitely wanted to avail ourselves of mm -hmm. Can, can I speakers. just interject for a quick second? Uh -huh. Because we're using the word trauma, but we're not defining it so trauma. that people yeah. understand what uh, may be considered trauma for people. Okay. Yeah. Right. Do you want to define it? You can define it a lot of times, mm -hmm. but trauma is an event that, uh, that is so extraordinary that it affects the actual physical brain and it causes reactions that stay fairly permanent. Um, you can have a trauma that frightens you and you go, oh gosh, and it's not a permanent thing. We've all been scared or somebody jumped out and said boo. That's not permanent. Trauma is something so severe and out of the ordinary that it actually affects a part of the brain that continually then affects the person. So if I was held up by three people with glasses like yours, and maybe they had sunglasses so I wouldn't recognize them, if it was severe enough, there'll be a change in my brain that will begin to react anytime I see sunglasses that's a warning, that's a warning. And pretty soon you say, wait a minute, there's nothing wrong. I'm wearing sunglasses. But my whole brain nerves, my whole self-survival has been affected. Mm -hmm. And you see kids like that, you brush them and they're like, don't touch me. You see parents like that who are like, don't do that, why are you criticizing me? Some of the anger comes because of the change in the brain and its effect on the body. And part of our work is to calm that down and help build different neurological uh, synapses. So we're talking about the full gamut of what we call atrocities that take place within families. Uh, physical abuse or corporal punishment, um, some uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, domestic abuse. You also have sudden uh, deaths within families and you also have the gang activity which we mentioned before so if I become accustomed to hearing gunshots and I duck and hide is that trauma are you afraid you're gonna get killed of course yes yeah it is and if I live in that particular community 
that would mean that you are living with that problem every day. Yes. Every day. Yeah. So I want to bring it back. You spoke about school counselors benefiting and and PNPs, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners also benefiting. Uh, what about the the schools? Well, Project True Project Hill, we've managed to got to go to all the Catholic primary schools within the Lee's city. And what we're finding is they have they themselves have experienced a lot of trauma. Take perfect examples, both um, St. Ignatius and St. Martin's. They've had trauma right within their parameters. And so a lot of times we've done with St. Ignatius, they themselves have gone through stuff. And so what we're trying to do is before we even go to the children, we're trying to work with the teachers to have them process some of their trauma, learn some techniques on how to calm down that particular part of the brain referred to as the amygdala so that the children can start learning. One of the things that Jean shares consistently with the teachers, which is I think is very important, is that if a child has been traumatized or any individual has been traumatized, if we don't take the time in a class or in some form of formal setting to calm down that part of the brain, the amygdala, they don't actually access that frontal cortex, the thinking part of their brain. So what happens is if that is engaged throughout, they're not always learning within the classroom. And so the importance of that, she really does a good job of drawing the brain, explaining it and breaking it down to them, the importance of understanding why it's important for us to work on calming down the amygdala. So that's important for teachers to learn. So we present to sometimes 10, 15, and then sometimes we have 44 like the last one. But I mean, I can't deny the teachers have been fully engaged because they're learning techniques. They're learning, okay, when a child comes in, I can do the shaking thing, I can do this technique, I can do that technique. And like I said, it's also for them internally because some of them do have various things that they have been exposed to while yes. teaching at the school. Mm -hmm. So, how, how do you get uh, people to start thinking about all of these issues differently, especially when some people look at it as it's cultural or, you that's know, how um, I grew up. yeah, that's how I grew up. My mom beat my pants off and I didn't die. I'm a better person for it. Or I grew up with domestic violence in my house and that's my reality. So I react this way and all of that. How do you get people to start looking at it differently and also to recognize in children, for example, and help them through that process? <laughs> um, it takes time. I think Jean's been really consistent with saying that, and I'm hoping we can go back and do some grant writing and have her back, but it, it's not something that's going to happen in a one-time workshop. It's something that has to continuously happen, one. Mm -hmm. I think, two, she attacks it from the brain development, which is scientifically proven. You can take brain scans and you'll see that the brain has changed. And so I think from that perspective where there's something physical, because sometimes when we do talk therapy, we're talking about feelings, we're talking about all those stuff, and it's not necessarily physical. But when you talk about the brain, the actual brain, you're talking about something physical, I think there's that connection, first of all. Mm -hmm. um, we break it down to just giving different examples. She's an excellent storyteller. She has Michael's <laughs> stories. She has various different stories, and her stories engage them. And what we've found so far is that when she starts telling those stories and start doing the, the physical breakdown of the brain, you hear the conversations. Mm -hmm. So you actually physically witness that change where they're actually asking questions or saying, you know, I have a kid that did that or I have my daughters displaying that. And so they share a lot. So we've seen them been a little bit more open, but it's not going to happen immediately. I mean, she stresses a lot about learning how to create support groups within schools because which is true. I mean, building relationship helps heals trauma. And some people don't want to sit in a room with a therapist. Some people are comfortable with your friend. But it also is depending on how that friend interacts with you. Not saying, oh, well, you shouldn't have been to that with him. You shouldn't have been to that. In saying, oh, I kind of hear you're really exhausted. You're really frustrated at what's going on. You know, being a lot more empathetic. And you know, because just simply sometimes doing that for somebody, as opposed to just getting on the negative bandwagon, whether correcting you or bringing down the person you might be talking about having that feeling validated. And so we taught them a little bit about that too as well. So we're doing it in small increments. But like I said, the hope is one, that she'll be back, or two, that we'll continue to do some works within the school because there's a lot of healing that still needs to be done. And so it's I, beginning. And I think it's, it's probably perfect that you start within the schools and hopefully it, it goes into the families. But let's talk about community. Uh, and Jenny, we, we've spoken about this several times. When there was that huge issue uh, with the murders on George Street. We, we had a conversation about trauma. That was, that was the very incident where we said that we're living in a trauma uh, affected in a community. And we hear people speak about shootings and uh, gang warfare 
And we have had surveys that prove that many children have seen dead bodies, many children have seen shootings or heard gunshots. So we know that the community here in Belize City, I can specify, have, has, has definitely had a lot of exposure to violence. Mm -hmm. How do we take lessons learned from uh, this particular training and somehow get it to uh, affect the wider community who, without even knowing it, uh, are living with trauma? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that um, Tina has organized for us is that there's a core group of um, counselors who are going to get a three-day training from Jean. Mm -hmm. We're going to actually learn some of the techniques. Um, in fact, she's, taught, she's talked about teaching us hypnosis, hypnosis mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. teaching us the tapping techniques from, the from the thought field and the mm -hmm. EMDR. So we're going to have those things in our, in our bag of tricks mm -hmm. that we're going to be able to hopefully work with the communities. Now, we can't go out there in mass and grab yeah. communities. But for example, we would be able to hopefully respond if there's a shooting near a school, in front of a school, like there was at St. Ignatius. Mm -hmm. um, so we would have that core group that would be able to actually do practical things mm -hmm. in the community. But again, we have to start small and we have yeah. to start You here have to start somewhere. City. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what are the, the, the techniques that we're talking about? Because you say hypnosis and people are like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Before I do that, uh -huh. helping the community reach out to community members mm -hmm. is probably w because relationship is what heals. Mm -hmm. yeah. So back to hypnosis. Uh -huh. We're all hypnotized. Mm -hmm. We've all we all have automatic reactions to certain things. So um, you talk about Christmas and you start to feel good. That's because sure. a part of our brain has already been conditioned. Mm -hmm. um, certain memories make you sad, certain memories make you happy, that type of thing? Sort of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and hypnosis. We all hypnotize ourselves every day. Do you ever daydream? Mm -hmm. Ding! So now what people do is, you can't, you can't be hypnotized by another person if you don't want it. But I look at some of those kids who are getting called into gangs and they think it's their only survival, they're sort of hypnotized. Mm -hmm. When somebody is really hurting, they're a little bit in a trance. Mm -hmm. So part of our job is to help people learn how to use their brain by helping them find techniques of going deeper within conscious, subconscious, unconscious, and building patterns that are going to work for them, not against them. So a positive pattern that will help people do what they need to do mm -hmm. rather than react automatically. So it's going back to that calming down that portion of the brain that's agitated. And activating other parts. OK. What are the other techniques that you use? You have a bag of tricks. <laughs> you know, I do work with the brain and the body. Mm -hmm. There is um, a wonderful technique mm -hmm. that doesn't work with everyone. See, a therapist needs to have a whole bag that they can... Yeah, called eye movement or bilateral sensitization, where sometimes trauma is stuck in you, you're just shaking, you can't get it loose, you start working with the brain to start moving patterns or moving nerve patterns to loosen that up. Um, with the kids, we use a big exercise ball and the kids learn to push in a way, or hug, or beat in a way that lets out certain energies, but it doesn't cause harm. Mm -hmm. Anytime you cause harm to another person, you're causing harm to yourself. A father who slaps his kid is hurting himself, causing different nerve patterns to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. So there are about, there's a ton, and that's what I, so come to a classroom. Okay. <laughs> I will. I wanted to ask specifically, um, because a lot of the violence that we see in the wider society is meted out by young men to other young men. Mm -hmm. 
Now, obviously, uh, working with Project Heal or even the mentor, these are often the young men that don't come in contact with uh, these kinds of sure. uh, institutions. Yeah. I want to say interventions mm -hmm. very easily, unless they're incarcerated for some reason and they get that, and then they still think it's a little survival thing for now mm -hmm. until I can get out there and do. I, I guess the question I how do you, uh, or what is the hope in terms of reaching out to those traumatized, mm -hmm. hypnotized mm -hmm. young men who may be the ones who at this point may need it desperately um, yeah. to save their lives and to save other people's lives. Yes. Well, we have, we are fortunately both a part of um, um, a project called the Metamorphosis Project run through Belize, um, um, through Mr. Belize, sorry. Mm -hmm. And they have taken children from three different schools, a second cohort. And really what we really do is we go and we ask the, the school, okay, give me the kid that's borderline, you're ready to kick him out. He's been, he has had several suspensions. You know, you don't know what else to, to try with him at this point. You know, you want to keep him in school, but you're exhausted because you've tried a lot. And so we literally get, um, I think, about six from each school. And we work with them for about 24 months almost. And it, it takes time. It's not, I, I mean, it's not one of those, definitely not a one week or two day workshop. And so we have four trained um, professional therapists that work with them. We have trained social workers that work with them. So we work with them, the school, and the family. And so what this does, yes, it's not the entire communities, but these are the young men at risk. And we do pick schools that we know have a lot of, been traumatized by a lot that's been going on in the school, in the homes, and so forth. So that is part of our outreach. And that, that specific team will also be trained in additional bags of tricks um, that we'll be learning from Jean. Because, I mean, we did the forest cohort and we've learned a lot, but there's so much when you go in and you think you know. You think you know, true? <laughs> And you go in and you dive in and there's so much hurt, so, so much an onion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's generational. It's not so even it's not just, just choosing to be bad. Because mm -hmm. that's what people think uh, the wider community right. tends to think sometimes. Exactly. People choose to be bad. It's experiences. And they have layers and layers and layers mm -hmm. of trauma. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about these are kids who are they're living in alcoholic homes, um, who are seeing their mothers being beaten on a daily basis who are themselves being beaten on a daily basis. And I'm not talking about just getting hit. I'm talking about real brutality, Seriously. yes. Um, and then they come to school, and a lot of times they're coming to school without a meal. So aren't you going to be an angry kid? Aren't you going to be a kid who sits in class and, and cannot learn because the brain is so profoundly affected? Or they have normalized. That that's the way life should be. And, and, yeah. and that brings us back to the window of tolerance. When we talk about various people's different windows of tolerance, they fall below the window of tolerance. They're at that point where they're very desensitized, that's the word we use, um, to trauma. So it doesn't move them. It just seems, oh, well, this is what happens. And some people are there. So as bad as, as, bad as it is to live in trauma, it's worse if you think trauma is normal. Yes, because you pass it on. Mm -hmm. and you continue to live in it and you continue to um, bring others into it mm -hmm. so you know sometimes we look at a parent who really beats his kid you find out when the, when the parent was beating when the parent was abused when the parent was hurt when the parent could not get a job and watched his family hungry and people then would say to that parent, you know, what good are you? Those also are traumas. To watch people you love suffer and then to feel the blame, that also affects somebody very deeply. Many times fathers leave because they can't quite tolerate. They might not articulate that, mm -hmm. but they get out of there because they can't tolerate who they are within the family. So they go get another woman, start over. It's soothing the brain, it's not solving the problem. Is it easy, or, or how difficult is it to be able to engage the children? I mean, you, you teach the teacher's skills of how to calm down this trauma-affected part of the brain 
so that you can engage the part that will make them learn. But I mean, is it a, a big challenge for the teachers to be able to do that? Are we asking too much of them? That's, that's really the, the fundamental you're, problem. You, Question. You're asking something huge of them. You're yeah. asking them to take care of themselves and each other. You're asking something that sometimes people might feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But what is the choice? You're in the classroom. You're responsible for these young people. Kick them out? That doesn't solve anything. Now they're in a different kind of classroom, the classroom of the streets. These teachers need so much support and care so that they can be dealing with their own stress so that they can start to deal with the stress here. And people like Rosanna and you, <laughs> you can. in there helping so that they're not alone. It's not being alone in a struggle of compassion. And it is a struggle of compassion. It's not a war. So let me ask a question, because you talked about uh, collectively about generational trauma that has gone on. And we talk about the ravages of slavery, of colonialism, of so many other things. And I want to, to, to focus on that for a second because there's so many things that people do and they think, you know, well, that's the way it has always been done. So yeah. how do you, and you, you know, so many quotes talk about not revis revisiting the past because you can't fix it on the future, but how do you bridge and let people understand uh, those things are important to deal with before you can move on as well without being uh, stagnant there or somehow trapped in, in that generational curse, so to speak. I don't know how else to say. That's an excellent question and I think it needs to be considered by all of us. Mm -hmm. I was spanked, I'm going to spank my child. I was beaten, I'm going to beat my child. That's the kind of thing that you're thinking of. And it takes a community of healing. It also takes the wonderful experience of correcting your child in a way that allows him to grow and not react. A spanking, a hitting, a beating, a yelling causes a reaction it doesn't cause growth. Now I'm not somebody that is easy on discipline. I believe in discipline. But there are ways to discipline that cause growth, that help people build an internal structure and isn't based on reaction or trauma or pain. It's, you know, a, a, an athlete has to discipline himself and sometimes he doesn't want to get up. He doesn't want to do that work. It's hard. So is developing a healthy personality that isn't living in trauma and trauma reactions. It's hard, but it's possible. I, I you know, William, we've been saying for years that we need to stop beating our kids. In fact, remember the resistance that, that mm -hmm. we got when they took corporal punishment out of the schools? Mm -hmm. But now we have all the evidence that proves that beating children profoundly affects them, long-term damage, right? And, and what Jean is bringing here are ways of us, you know, talking to people, showing them that be by beating your child, you're just adding to the trauma that's already occurred, and you continue to do this. In schools, particularly when you're screaming at children and sometimes these children just sit there and they don't react because they numb out, they, they block you out because they've gone back to a place that's just really, really painful for them. And, and I, I keep talking about this over and over and over all the time. But finally, finally, if you, you can read now about all the stuff, the, the brain studies, about the long-term changes to the brain. Okay, so hopefully, I hope people come and that we're able to continue to spread this message mm -hmm. until you come back, Jean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think too, because you talk a lot, you're referring to the generational one, yeah. and it's yeah. cyclical. It's, it's a cycle. So what happens is my my 
grandparents did this, so my parents did this, and it continues. What breaks it is the process of self-awareness, knowledge, learning something different. And it might not necessarily be in that next generation because it takes time to take place. But the only way you can get break out of a circle is if you create a window. And that window is created through learning more about yourself, learning your triggers, learning what triggers you, learning why that triggered you, and then deciding to do different. But that's the break right there. So that's how you get, get out of the generational circle. We have to wrap, but I have... Yep. One other question that I think <laughs> the exact thing for me anyway. Um, yesterday I had a, a very interesting uh, situation with two young men mm -hmm. at the university level. And one of the things that dawned on me, even as we're conversing here, is the idea that when you talk about having, suppressing the immediate response, the fear, the lashing out, the everything else, you're seen as weak when you're a when you're a man mm -hmm. and we had a conversation repeatedly they were shouting at each other you know we were trying to intervene and to get them to see uh, a different way but it was almost as though you're screaming against the wind and facing the sea kind of thing so how do you break through to people to let them understand for example that it is a higher level in terms of behavior and everything else instead of this having this response that they have no control over. And I, I agree with you because they're almost in a trance and they're doing all of this anger, reacting. But it's how do you get them to actually recognize that, especially when it's in the heat of the moment. And I ask that particular question because that's when they're a danger to other people to and to themselves. Yeah. So. I usually don't react in the heat of the moment because I'm going to get hit. But afterwards, if you were looking at those two guys and they admire you and you're in a relationship and you said, you know, I saw you get a hold of yourself, get control of yourself. I saw that. How did you do it? You just affirmed an action. I saw you back off. Instead of saying you coward, you say, where did you get the strength to stop the fight? And sometimes with the kids, you say, how did you do that? Everybody was screaming and you calmed down. What you're doing is using your relationship with that person to help them start to recognize there's something good about being, and you're recognizing it as strong. There's something good about a different kind of strength. Um, you can say to a teacher, those kids were so out of control and you stayed calm. How did you do that? That's an affirming question and it helps people go, wow. So I do, I teach teachers to have out of the corner of their eyes, this is the worst kid. He's always out of control. And he without thinking, picks up a pencil and puts it on the desk. And you go, thank God you're in my classroom. I saw what you did. Hmm. Do you know how powerful that is? Yeah. It is, we need to start using our relationship mm -hmm. yeah. to help people see different strengths. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's, uh, that's such a powerful statement that you said there because we speak almost daily about remembering the one positive out of all the negatives or sometimes <laughs> but it's a reconditioning yeah it takes time. difficult we we will remember all the bad things people tell us but never the good um so it's uh, also identifying the good in people as well that has to be worked on um we ha we're completely out of time so we do have to <laughs> we, we've had an extended segment here but i think the work that you all are doing are it's extremely important um for the children that attend these schools, that will work with these families and are a part of these communities. And hopefully uh, we will begin to see the effects of it. Um, I know it'll take time, but soon as well. Um, so thank you and uh, best of luck. Is there any event that is open to the public? So if I'm a parent that wants to come and learn some of these techniques, 
or a teacher from another school who'd like to come and learn these techniques, are there any sessions open for the wider public? They'd have to contact the Mental Health Association. Okay. Um, that number is in the phone book. Okay. Or call 113. <laughs> it's at the resource center? It's a resource the center. The resource center on? Um, call Sandra. Okay. To get um, to find a seat. It's $35 mm -hmm. because we're paying for the snacks and the lunch mm -hmm. and the venue. And when is it? It's on the 20th. Okay. okay, so people can attend. There will be space to learn some of these techniques. They can call Sandra and see how many spaces How many spaces are, are available. All right. Well, thank you ladies very much for joining us and uh, very uh, interesting food for thought. Eye-opening conversation. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and take a break and when we come back, it will be to focus on Valentine's Day. And, uh, We're how, talking about love now. <laughs> yeah. How do we spread the love with flowers? We'll be right back after these messages. <laughs> 